In this episode of Ask Dr. Zach. Well, I'm dealing with high blood pressure for some years now. And a couple of years ago, I had a strong uh, discomfort pain shooting down my arm. And later... I suffer from depression. Meds don't help. I was taking Ciprolex and I was just a zombie and I was tired all the time. Never wanted to do anything. Then, on the doctor's orders... The main problem usually between doctors and patients is communication. So, a way to prevent this is to make sure to ask questions. If you don't understand something, say, hey, wait, doc, I want to know what's going on here. I don't understand. In the ER, I deal with trauma and life-threatening situations every day. I've seen it all. I know firsthand that accurate medical advice can save lives. I'm Dr. Zach, and I'm passionate about empowering people to take control of their own health. This is your chance to ask me health questions. No question too big, no question too small. Today we'll be discussing blood pressure. It's an issue that affects millions of people. A healthy blood pressure is important. High blood pressure increases your risk for heart attack, stroke and kidney disease, while low blood pressure can increase your risk of dizziness and passing out. Let's learn more about blood pressure from the Blossom Medical Animation. The heart is a beating muscle that pumps oxygen-rich blood to the body through a network of arteries and veins. What we commonly call blood pressure is the measurement taken when the heart's left ventricle contracts and blood is forced through the arteries. As the blood travels from the heart, it exerts pressure against the walls of the arteries. This is referred to as blood pressure. Blood pressure is used to evaluate the force and amount of blood being pumped from the heart as well as the flexibility and condition of the arteries. There are two components of a blood pressure measurement. The first is the systolic pressure, which is recorded when blood pressure is at its maximum during contraction of the left ventricle. The second component is diastolic pressure. This measurement is obtained when the blood pressure is at its lowest point, when the heart is at rest between beats. The combined measurement is read as the systolic pressure over the diastolic pressure. Abnormally high pressure within the arteries is called hypertension or high blood pressure. Hypertension is usually diagnosed when blood pressure measurements are higher than 140 millimeters of mercury systolic and 90 millimeters of mercury diastolic on three separate occasions. Blood pressure levels between 120 over 80 and 139 over 89 are known as pre-hypertension and these patients should be monitored regularly. Hypertension is linked with many medical conditions, such as atherosclerosis, congestive heart failure, stroke, heart attack, and kidney damage, to name a few. If left untreated, hypertension can seriously damage the heart and blood vessels. The good news is that patients with hypertension can usually control their disease with medication and with changes to diet and lifestyle. And we'll be right back with a lot more about blood pressure. Stay with us. Up next... Well, I'm dealing with high blood pressure for some years now. And a couple of years ago, I had a strong uh, discomfort pain shooting down my arm. All this and more right after this short break. Well, I'm dealing with high blood pressure for some years now. And a couple of years ago, I had a strong uh, discomfort pain shooting down my arm. And I thought it might have had something to do with the heart. I went to um, eMERGE and uh, they said it wasn't because it took so long to heal and so on. And I still have a time when it, it's uncomfortable to this day. I wondered if it, um, it, if it had anything to do with a stroke, because I also noticed some words that I was slurring. I have numbness here, and I still have, you know, at times, discomfort. I am very active and, and fit, and I 
you know, do yoga classes, Pilates classes, and freelance around the city of Toronto and give classes and have done for 20 years now. I'd like to meet with Dr. Zach and ask him some of these questions and, and see what he can uh, help me with. Now it's time to ask Dr. Zach. And welcome Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. So let's start off, just tell me a little bit about your health history. Well, I have um, been taking um, something for blood pressure for the last 30 years okay. or more, which is surprising because uh, my mother did not have high blood pressure and I think I have a, a good lifestyle and look after myself. And I'm just, you know, it's just interesting that I'm taking this Mavic, Mavic two milligram okay. Mavic for yeah. And 30 years? Sometime. Yes. And how's your blood pressure on the Mavic? Is it okay? It's fine. Huh. It is fine. And uh, so uh, have you ever had any high blood pressure since you've been on the medication? Um, no, it's, it's kind of been keeping it fairly low, like I'm in the 80s now and, hmm. yeah. you know, is yeah, well, 120 some oh, yeah. odd over in the That's sort of like uh, what? in the perfect range. <laughs> yes, the norm. Actually, recently there was an article, because we always recommended people stay in the 140 over 90, or definitely under 140 and under 90. And just uh, very recently there was an article suggesting that even lower, like where you are, well, the 120 over 80 is actually, uh, is, is actually beneficial in terms of decreasing people's risk even further for heart attack and stroke. So anyway, you're in the right mm. ballpark. And the other question is, do you need to be on blood pressure medication at all? Mm -hmm. There's no way to know that without stopping. But on the other hand, if it's not broken, I'm not sure it needs to be fixed. You know, So if your blood yes. pressure is well controlled, uh, I don't really necessarily tell people to stop medication that they're on if they feel fine mm -hmm. and the numbers are good. But if you're having any problem with it, then it's, it may be worth considering a different one. Right. Do you have any other health issues? Have you ever had any chest pain or headaches or... Anything I had like an, an interesting, uh, about three years ago, an interesting pain that came from the, my, what felt like my spine through the shoulder right down the arm. Oh. And it was so strong and so relentless that I thought I was having a heart attack. Yeah. So I went to Emerge and they couldn't explain it, but they said it's not a heart attack. And, um, you know, I've, I've been challenged with that ever since. In oh, other really? words, I think there's nerve damage uh -huh. and uh, there's even numbness in, the, oh. yeah, in part of the hand. So I never did, you know, with all the professionals that I talked to, I never did get a, a good answer. I mean, I was suggesting to them that I thought it was a, a nerve yes. that had damaged and, you know, was repairing, but nobody ever confirmed that or, you know, which was, you know, too bad. But I was, found myself the odd time a word would be slurring hmm. and I also was biting the tongue you know oh. just out of I don't know I, I felt it was out of nowhere and more than I ever had before yeah so with that slurring and with that biting I kind of thought that maybe I had had a, a stroke a stroke yeah. you know but I was told that one can tell if you have a stroke through your your blood and because I was getting blood work done every year nobody ever mentioned that so I thought well you know it's probably not the case but it was curious yeah well so you bring up a lot yeah let's go back we'll just go back for one second to the first thing which is this pain that you mentioned that's going from uh, your neck down into your arm and which yeah, the sure. emergency doctors told you was not a heart attack which by the way I work in the emergency department that we're very good at telling you what it's not uh, because basically we're really focused on you know is it something that's gonna kill you you know what I mean yes. is it a stroke is it a heart attack is it something you're bleeding internally and then we rule all that out and mm -hmm. then sometimes people are like okay so what do I have and we'll be like I don't know but it's not gonna <laughs> kill you follow up with your regular doctor so I'm sure they were right about that but you're right it does sound that does sound like a nerve issue maybe the ulnar nerve because there's a number of different nerves that go into the arm and the hand one of which is the ulnar nerve, and that's the one that gives you sensation to the pinky. Yeah, and that's where you were. That's where you were pointing that you had some numbness. Yeah, actually, right through the arm. At times, I even felt heat oh, in yeah. different spots. So you know, if that's bothering you a fair bit, it, it does deserve follow-up because there's a number of tests that can be done to figure out where that nerve is being injured. So probably the nerve is being inflamed or irritated somewhere. But you know, the thing is, it can be anywhere from the neck all the way down. So it can be a disc in the neck. It can be something in the shoulder. But with tests, there's a, a number of different tests that can be done. There's an EMG, neurologist test, there's MRIs, but that could actually pinpoint where the problem is. 
with respect to the other thing you mentioned, so that's the, the slurred speech and the biting of the tongue, and yeah. that is something, you know, potentially significant. Mm -hmm. And if, if ever, you know, you were having that and it didn't go away, or even if you have it for a significant amount of time, it probably is worth getting checked out because it is a concerning symptom. It doesn't necessarily mean something terrible is happening. But you're right, slurred speech, weakness on one side of the body, um, numbness on one side of the body, difficulty walking, all those things can be symptoms of a stroke. And one of the things we do, even if it's not a stroke, you can get other tests done. One of the very common tests that we do is we'll do an ultrasound, an ultrasound of the heart to see if there's any blockages in the heart. Mm -hmm. Another thing is an ultrasound in the neck to look at the carotid arteries to see if there's any blockages in the big arteries of the neck. Because mm -hmm. that's where you get a lot of blood supply to the brain. And if there's any blockage there, that can cause a stroke. Uh -huh. Now, Dr. Zach's prognosis. Yvonne suffers from blood pressure. She's been on medication for the past 30 years. Now she's interested, or she would like, to get off the medication. The problem is, honestly, it's unlikely she's going to be able to get off medication after 30 years because blood pressure usually goes up with age, not down with age. However, the only way to know for sure would be, I guess, to taper the blood pressure medication and stop it. And then if her blood pressure is too high, she's going to have to go back on it. Now, if she hasn't optimized her weight and her exercise and her diet, she can do those things. By doing those things, she can see how well she can do without being on any medications at all. As for the other symptoms she was talking about, she was talking about slurred speech. If ever that happens and it doesn't go away, it's a reason to go see the doctor. Go see them emergently, like right away, especially if it's associated with any other neurological symptoms, weakness or numbness, difficulty walking or confusion. You gotta see the doctor right away. For now, stay on the medication, talk to her doctor, keep up with a good diet and regular exercise, and I think she'll be fine. Now, it's time to ask Dr. Zach about an illness that affects one in four people. Mental illness is a common issue that affects a lot of people, with some experiencing major depression. It's associated with an increased risk of other illnesses, like stroke and some forms of cancer, and one's risk of mental illness is increased by having physical illness, like heart disease. Having a mental illness does increase the risk of suicide, but good treatments are available. To learn more about mental health, let's take a look at this amazing Blausen medical animation. The brain is composed of millions of interconnecting nerve cells called neurons. In order for a person to think, move, or feel, these neurons must communicate with one another. They do so by sending and receiving chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. When a neurotransmitter is released from a neuron, it crosses a cleft or synapse and binds to a receptor on another neuron. Thus, the signal is passed on. Unlike the blues, sadness, or even grief, depression is a condition in which a person feels an overwhelming and debilitating unhappiness. People who are depressed may have trouble thinking clearly and be unable to perform normal functions. They may be uninterested in eating and be unable to sleep, or they may engage in these activities excessively. Persons with depression may even have thoughts of suicide. Although depression can be triggered by an emotional event in a person's life, a decrease in the levels of one of the neurotransmitters, serotonin, has been linked in the biology of depression. There are many forms of depression. Therefore, it is important for a person who may be depressed to see a doctor who can accurately diagnose the depression and prescribe appropriate therapy. And we'll have much more on Ask Dr. Zach after the break. Still ahead. I suffer from depression. Meds don't help. I was taking Ciprolex and I was just a zombie and I was tired all the time. Dr. Zach, because I suffer from depression, meds don't help. I basically turn into a zombie when I'm on them. So kind of trying to stick to more exercise and doing meditation and stuff like that. The working out in meditation has been great because it helps with my mood, losing weight, and just happier. I was taking Ciprolex 
and I was just a zombie and I was tired all the time. Never wanted to do anything. My son doesn't like it when I have a bad day because normally we go out for walks, we go bike riding, we go and do stuff at Harborfront or the zoo, fun stuff. And if I'm having a bad day, pretty much just chilling out at home. I'm seeing progress and I'm really ha happy with the way that things are going. And I guess just trying to find out if I can talk to Zach about more long-term results. Now it's time to ask Dr. Zach. And welcome, Kendra. Nice to meet you. You too. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having sharing me. Sharing your story. So you, I understand you have suffered from depression? Yes. Um, since shortly after I had my son, I suffered from postpartum. Mm -hmm. And then it also kind of snowballed into problematic eating with that as well. When was your pregnancy? How long ago? Uh, in December 2007 is when I had my son. Yeah. <clears throat> so shortly after that. Yeah, so it's been a number of years. Yeah. So now you're not on any medication, is that no. right? Okay. And still, but you still have some symptoms? Having some real down days. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, getting really sensitive about certain things. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of, I started going to the Pickering Physio Institute. Yeah. And working with a fellow who's a naturopathic doctor. Okay. And doing acupuncture. Mm -hmm and then going walking all the time, going to the gym, yeah. and especially the past three months, so I've dropped 30 pounds wow. in the past three Good months. Wow, good job. Yeah. Wow, that's great. So, and then using doTERRA oils okay. instead of the meds, yeah. which seemed to help as seemed well. Seemed to help, yeah. yeah. Did you have any, any change in your energy level? Less. Less, yeah, that's yeah. sort of classic. Any issues with concentration or focusing? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I own my own business as well, and Time management and staying on task is definitely an issue. Yeah. And how about enjoying, like being able to enjoy the things that you used to enjoy, was that difficult? Um, up until about three months ago, mm -hmm. it was hard. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How about sleep? Did it affect your sleep? Um, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes okay. I'd sleep maybe three, four hours a night. You feel like you're starting to improve or it's still... I have my days where mm -hmm. I'm kind of down, yeah. but... Lately, and for the most part, things are getting better. Oh, good. Yeah. But the problem that I have is at nighttime. Yeah. So if I get down or I get stressed out, it's, oh, where's Red Bull? Where's Sour Keys? Uh -huh. Things like that. Are you talking about when you're going to bed, or what are you doing at that time? Um, once my son's in bed. Mm -hmm. And because, like I said, I'm self employed. Yeah. So I work from home, and it's all on the computer. Uh -huh. And oftentimes it gets stressful. And do you have anything that you do? Because you mentioned you're at, you have activities and exercise. Do you ever do that in the evening? I do my workouts and stuff in the evening. Okay. Once my son's in bed. But um, with the time management and staying on task, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing that some people do is they do break it up. So they have some, some workout uh, earlier on in the day, some workout later in the evening, especially if you're working at home, mm -hmm. it's nice to have something to break things up because you you're not forced to leave the house. Some people find it, uh, you know, it can be hard to, to stay in the same place all day. So forcing yourself out of the house, getting some kind of exercise can be helpful. So if you can find an activity that you really enjoy to start doing in the evenings, that will try to kind of kickstart your mood, put you into a better mood, and, it, and then hopefully you won't fall back into the, the habits of, you know, eating things that aren't good for you and whatnot. The most important thing is, you know, just to make sure you are still following up with a doctor. Yeah. I mean, there are certainly, sometimes people do need medications. It's certainly not the first choice, you know. So mm -hmm. all the things that you're doing, all the, you know, doing exercise, walking, staying active, if it's helping and it's not hurting you, you know, it's, it's worth a try. But also, just the belief that something will help you is very powerful. But if something is not helping you and you're having side effects from it, then you know definitely not worthwhile. Well, I think my issue is just having something that is going to work long term, mm -hmm. as opposed to sporadically. Because sometimes it gets actually harder and harder to treat the depression. Yeah. So that's why you know someone who's been treated multiple times and they continue to get worse, we do often recommend that they go on for the long term. But no one ever wants to be on medication long term, no. <laughs> and for good reason. You know, yeah. if there are things you can do, of course, you know why wouldn't you want to do the things you can do to control your depression. Well, exactly, and then you turn into a zombie sometimes on the meds. I definitely recommend that you follow up regularly with your doctor, even just to talk it over, you know, even just to talk about what things you find are working, what things are not necessarily working, things that you can do to improve. Um, and then there's always the, uh, the other things that you are doing, the sort of uh, integrative health practice. And if, they're, if you feel they're helping, then they're helping. You know, if they feel they're effective, then they are effective for you. Okay. 
And, and then in terms of medication, you know, it's always on the, it's always a potential if you really need it. And the truth is some people are really, really need it and really are helped by it. Mm -hmm. But if you can avoid them, you know, it's always, it's always nice to yeah. avoid them. Don't get your blood pressure up. We'll be right back. Doctor's orders are, if you think you've been mistreated in the medical system, you need to complain. Number one, you need to get all the information that you can, and you have a right to all the information from your encounter in the medical system. And number two, you complain. Go to the head of the department, go to the hospital ombudsman, find out who's in charge, and you can get some satisfaction. Now remember, the main problem usually between doctors and patients is communication. So a way to prevent this is to make sure to ask questions. If you don't understand something, say, hey, wait, doc. I want to know what's going on here. I don't understand. It's really important. Now it's time for you to ask Dr. Zach. Welcome back. Now is the time when we take some questions from the audience. First question, please. My name is Pavan Bansal, and I'm an artist. Two years and uh, three months uh, ago, I had a stroke. Hmm. The effect that I find is uh, I have lost interest in doing anything at all. There's a very high incidence of uh, depression after stroke, and if not just depression, there's something called anhedonia, which is that people don't get the same enjoyment from things that they used to get pr prior to that. And often it's related as well to not having the same amount of interest that they used to have. Mm -hmm. and, and there is definitely treatment for that, because it's not uncommon at all. I would say almost the majority of people post-stroke have that. And we usually treat them, there's some medications, usually in the class of what we call SSRI medications, that can actually help for those symptoms. So I would say, I would reconsult with a doctor, you know, tell them uh, what we talked about and the symptoms you're having, uh, because there's no reason you can't, uh, you know, get a little more spring in your step again. Thank you. Pleasure. And that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank my guests for coming in and chatting with me. I want to thank the studio audience. That's it for today. Thank you very much. And remember to join us next time on Ask Dr. Zach.